Do we have situations right now where the government does not understand what a permanent civil service is and what its value to governance of this country? Because if the government, let's say, collapses tomorrow, the country will continue to run with the civil service until they can be civil service and get a government put in place. No, but right now you have a situation where the, the prime minister has to determine who is the chief electoral officer. She determines who is the chairman and the majority of the people on the electoral and boundaries commission. She determines who is the commission of police. She determines who is the chief education officer, the chief, the, the control of customs, and every other government department. Mind you, in Trinidad, when they put some of the provisions in place, that the prime minister must be consulted with these things. And the, commis the commission tell the prime minister, yeah, consultation means just that. You, that was part of money. We don't have to obey you. And he wants to put a particular person as permanent secretary commission, but he's not our man. And the commission appointed the man they wanted to appoint. But the money took them to court. And the court rule, we consulted. That's all you're required to do, consult. Yeah. Okay. It means that the prime minister makes the decision. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you have a situation now where she came up with the idea that you can put senior civil service on contract. Now, now this is this is the thin end of the wedge you get in. Let's say you have a, a senior civil service contract. This senior civil service is to advise the minister, give the minister independent advice. But my contract coming up. You gotta give me advice they want, or your contract can get with you. So that is what is happening, public service. They're destroying and dismantling everything that made us great. Yeah, wow. You we know, this civil servants, we exported civil servants and teachers throughout the Caribbean. No people are laughing at us. Well, I, I can I can I can support what you're saying, Caswell, because when I was involved in you know trade negotiations at CARICOM and at the international level. We used to take great pride in the fact that it really it, it didn't where Barbados was concerned because we would go to meetings and you know you would hear delegations talking about how they had elections so they weren't able to do X Y Z. Barbados was very pro that that was never the case with us. Anything that was coming up on the agenda, whether we had elections, who out who won who in or who out, we were able to represent Barbados seamlessly. And that was because we had a civil service that whoever the minister was that came in, they would get a proper briefing and could go off and represent Barbados. And we were very proud of that. No, all of that has been destroyed. Yeah. Yeah, I tell you, you know, and this is why why we're here. And um, thank you guys so much for the comment. As I said, I've been writing. I don't know about anybody else. This has been so educational. And, um, you know, Winston has come on, Winston Clark, and I want to hear he has a comment that he wants to make. And remember, guys, that you can use the StreamYard link and come into the program and um, and share your thoughts. So welcome, Winston. What's on your mind? Good night. Good night. Good night. Uh, thank you for having me, Arcia. Okay, I want to address this because this is a pressing issue that affects every single Barbadian, all right? This proposed idea to raise the pension age to 68, considering that the politicians lowered theirs from 55 to 50, yet want to raise ours to 68, this proposal without coming to the people of Barbados first is an unjust, non-transparent act, which will undoubtedly leave the elderly struggling, all right? And not only struggling, but struggling to make ends meet and compromising their well-deserved rest after a lifetime of hard work. Firstly, it is important to acknowledge the fundamental principle behind pension schemes. The promise of financial security in old age, and that's what a pension scheme is about. Workers contribute a portion of their hard earned income throughout their working lives with the expectation that this money will be returned to them when they retire and not spent by any government 
and then written off. Raising the pension age undermines this social contract as it forces people to work longer than they have planned and prevents them from enjoying the deserved retirement. Secondly, increasing the pension age disproportionately affects those who have physically demanding jobs or have health conditions. Many individuals in physically demanding occupations like sanitation service authority and general workers find it increasingly challenging to continue working at that age. The toll of physical labor on their bodies can lead to a higher risk of injuries and chronic health issues. By raising the pension age, we are effectively ignoring the struggles and hardships faced by these workers, putting their well-being at risk. Can you imagine a sanitation service authority worker at 68 behind one of those drugs? Moreover, raising the pension age neglects the importance of intergenerational equity. It is essential to ensure that younger generations have sufficient employment opportunities before unnecessarily competing for jobs with older workers who are forced to stay in the workforce due to an increased retirement age. By keeping older workers in the workforce for an extended period, we are preventing younger individuals from entering the job market and rendering their chances of progression and financial stability. Additionally, prolonging the retirement age and the mind the concept of work-life balance. Many people look forward to their retirement at a time to spend with their families, pursue personal interests, and engage in activities that they were unable to do while working. By increasing the per the pension age, we are denying them the opportunity to enjoy these precious moments and forcing them to continue working while sacrificing their loved ones and personal fulfillment. Lastly, it is crucial to consider the social economic implications of raising the pension age. As individuals are forced to work longer, there is a reduced capacity for job creation and employment opportunities for younger generations. This can lead to an increased burden on social welfare systems, further exacerbate social inequalities, and can even lead to increasing levels of crime. What do you think will happen when young men have no legitimate means of gaining employment? Now, ladies and gentlemen, members of the panel, it is undeniable that raising the pension age is fundamentally, fundamentally unfair. It disregards the principles of financial security in old age, places undue physical and emotional strain on workers, and the minds into generational equity. It is our responsibility to advocate for a fair and just society, one where retirement is a time of rest, enjoyment, and fulfillment for all not for all not retire, then shortly die after. It, I want all of us to come together. I challenge this unfair practice and demand policies that prioritize the well-being and dignity of our seniors. Barbados, together we can create a society that values and respects the contributions of every individual, regardless of their age. It is with this in mind that we call on the government of Barbados to be transparent and come to the people of Barbados. We advocate an island-wide sick hope on Wednesday, July the 2nd to show our disapproval of this secretive, non-transparent way the government is going about this situation. Remember, you are allowed two consecutive six days before taking in a doctor's certificate. Please, let each and every one of us play our part. Every single person has a role to play. Remember, this affects us, our children, and our children's children. Just one day, that's all I'm asking. Thank you, Marcia. Thank you, Paul. Wow. Thank you. Very well said. Very Thank well you. said, um, um, Mr. Clark. Thank you so very much for that and for coming in. And I'm seeing um, Mr. Strickland is um, in and wants to share something. And every you have that opportunity um, to do so um, before we close. Uh, Mr. Strickland, I'm going to open your microphone and and um, and have you you share. Welcome, sir. 
Let me see. Okay. Can you unmute your mic? Thank you. Good night yes. to the panelists. Good night to the listeners. Um, I listen with great um, interest what is happening to uh, an institution that I have been associated with for over 40 years. Um, I did work with Mr. Caswell Franklin <laughs> many years when we were downtown. Um, it is interesting that we would have had um, town hall meetings held across Barbados in respect of the whole issue of pensions, National Insurance Fund. I addressed the, the town hall meeting at Alexandria, and at that meeting, I would have indicated that because National Insurance is a tripartite board, in that both the National Union of Public Workers and the Barbados Workers Union, they have permanent seats on the board who represent all employees in Barbados. The Hotel Association and the Barbados Employers Confederation representing the employers of Barbados sit on the board. The representative from the, the Chief Labor Officer and the Director of Finance sit on the board. It means that of the nine member board, six represent special interest groups. And it's very, very unfortunate fortunate that after we had town hall meetings, which might only have been wind addressing, a decision has been taken of such that the people of Barbados, as it were, have had no say. Now, during the actual report, and this is something that I shared at the town hall meeting, during the actual report, it was stated that one out of eight person, self-employed persons are actually paying contributions. Now, it meant that from the time we had the around the 8% pay cut days, when there was a lot of um, downsizing and, and so forth in Barbados, there was a, very much of a shift from employed persons to self-employed persons. In 2020, again, there was a further shift. Nothing has been done, absolutely nothing has been done to capture that large block of persons who are currently employed, even though self-employed, and are not paying contributions. I actually made a suggestion so that from the perspective of the board sitting early by and allowing whether the prime minister, the government, whoever, to make this decision, it is extremely, extremely unfortunate. I worked between 2020, coming back from retirement, to June, and there have been tremendous requests by individuals to obtain an early pension because there are a lot of persons who 60 years and over have found it difficult to find employment, those who have lost their jobs, to be employed, only to find out that they will not qualify for an early pension because that reduction of 6%, of 6% at that point, does not allow them to have a pension of 243 per week. Now we've moved it from 6% to 9%. And we're moving it from 67 to 68. And therefore, there is tremendous psychological trauma in the lives of Barbadians, as I speak right now, who are suffering in silence simply because they were looking forward to maybe qualifying at age 63 because they were near the 243. Now we are shifting the goalposts even further. And the thing about it is, with all that has been said um, in respect of Parliament, nothing has been said where the Prime Minister or any, in, any other individual can make this decision four years again down the road. In other words, four years down the road, another Prime Minister or some person can come and make that decision overruling the board. And the thing about it is, while I was, uh, I, 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 as Willie was saying earlier, that 
um, the, the board does not employ staff, right now, as I speak, the, 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 the path is for the staff to now be employed by the board. So if um, could you, could you just, excuse me a second? Um, Caswell had said that he couldn't hear. Is it? Can you hear? No. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. Thank you very much. Sorry about that, Caswell. One thing to is while the staff are, to a large extent, are employed by central government, but there are a tremendous amount of contract workers. And I was one of them over the last over that three year period. No, it means that all staff members, all but both appointed and temporary staff members, will be facing the decision very shortly to opt whether to remain in the public service or to go with the board. And I can say to you that there is tremendous fear in the hearts of some of the staff members. Because if what we are seeing, where a decision has been made outside of the, 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 the control of the board, which I, I must repeat is tripartite, to make sure that government does not single-handedly do what they please, you can imagine what is going to happen with the National Insurance Fund. Now, we must, I must go back to when the decision when it was being suggested or when it was being said by the Prime Minister who were in opposition that they were going to raise the non contributory pensioners, I said boldly and I paid the ultimate price where I was engaged with, uh, um, um, with, with elections, whereby I said if the non contributory pensioners are given the kind of pension that they were being promised it means that they would have had to raise the minimum contributory pensioners and then you would have had to give all the pensions over and above them an increase i did not know that when arthur had made the same statement at the same time but exactly what uh, mr arthur said it came to pass because in my opinion it was like one of those um, promises that Jeff Joe made in the, in the Bible. But he promised that the first thing that came out of his house, he would offer as a sacrifice and end up being his daughter. We as Barbadians, the National Insurance Fund was put on, as a sacrifice for the political gains of individuals. And unfortunately, I, I must repeat, unfortunately, nothing has been said in Parliament whereby the present Prime Minister or another Prime Minister can go and make another decision to put us back to where we are. We have a serious falling birth rate in Barbados, and we have a serious aging population. And therefore, if the block of self employed persons that we have at present are not forced to pay contributions, and the suggestion I made at the town hall meeting is one that I have not heard anyone on the board or anyone else attempted to, 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 to look at and this is almost a year now that that that, that the whole meeting was held. So, you know, I, I am I'm really afraid for those persons, especially who were looking forward to an early pension. The, the, the 500 to the 750, personally, I do not have a big problem with that. Because between age 16 and 67, persons have enough time to put in 15 years contributions. And therefore, if we force those seven people who must, who are, are by law must pay contributions. If we force them to pay contributions, like when Arthur did many years with the ZRs and the minibus and so forth, there's a way of getting it done. I'm saying that the, the fund would not be depleted in the manner is because unfortunately, a lot of these persons who are self-employed, they, they get the, the unpleasant surprise at pension by age, applying for a non-contributory pension to realize that because they chose not to pay contributions, they are not going to get a pension in Barbados. So I think that a lot needs to be said and done because, and I really appreciate the, the, the panelists and for what you are doing and saying for the, the in respect of what happens on tomorrow in the Senate, 
I think it's going to be left up to the conscience of each person in the Senate after hearing and knowing what the Barbados have been saying since Friday. It's up to them to make a decision on whether they will vote yay or nay. But it is. But I think the, the National Fund is um, department is in a serious um, is in a serious position right now. Not only with the public, but also with the staff, and it's a the institution that is very dear to my heart. Thank you very much, Miss Weeks, for giving me the opportunity to share. Marcia, could I share something? Um, no, I wanted. I wanted to share. Go ahead, Miss McLean. Yeah, I wanted to say something. I really want to thank Mr. Strickland for coming in because he touched on the the whole issue of employees of, of national insurance and it takes me back to the point i was making about the the piece of legislation that should have been addressed in parliament and nothing has really been said about that because at the end of the day when i try to link contributions and when i think of of a couple of things the current structure and and what it means the possibility of moving away, even though we already have a, a corporate structure to the extent that, except for um, recruitment selection, you know, human resource matters, um, except for that, we have, we have a, let me call it a company for simplicity, a, a, a corporate structure. Lynette raised the possibility of move, of, of what was suggested in, and, and in a sense, I, um, skeptical or I am fearful not skeptical I am fearful that there has been no discussion because we have not been treated or we have not been given information on what the plans are and my worry is that there may be plans to address issues beyond staffing in terms of control of the financial resources the fund the money which is the people's investment in their pension. This is, as some, to use the technical term, they call it a mortgage, is a long-term investment, expecting, you know, your future return. So two things are happening. Staff don't know what's going on, and anything can happen. I remember, you you can think of the Health Queen of the Hospital when that, when that went to a, 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 a board and so on, but here you have people, and, and it's interesting that we just heard, because we were talking about temporary staff and permanent staff in the civil service, but as Caswell, Stephen just introduced contract workers in national insurance. You say for the last three years they've been using contract workers, and the question is, what are the implications? So I, I really believe, and I would say this and stop quickly, we have to ask government to take this thing back to the house and talk to us, debate the bill. Let us hear mm -hmm. what is planned. As Stephen pointed out, consultations were about a year ago about revitalization. Where's the report, the revitalization report? Can it, if, if there's one, uh, shouldn't it be tabled in parliament so that the public can have access to it? Do we know what the contents are? Do we know what the plans are? Because if you have a revitalization report, you have a minister's for our ministerial statement talking about revitalization. That statement should share with us in summary form, just as you will have a, an executive summary and a document, a summary form what they're planning to do. But we haven't heard any about that. So we, we have all, as, as Barbados, we have to be fearful about the implications. But the other thing, and I think that is important, is the point made about enforcement of the, the rules. National insurance is supposed to be compulsory. And, and we therefore have to say to people, you need to participate. One in eight, I think you said, um, on, on self-employed people contribute. Great. You know, and that's a lot of money. You know, and then they want benefits later on. I mean, I have had to talk to elderly people who come and say, you know, how, how I, I, I am so sorry I didn't contribute. That's why I say to Barbados, don't entertain the idea of dropping out the scheme. Because at the end of the day, as the, as the jingle said over the years, it's your lifeline. But we also have to say, when we, we have to start by making sure that people pay. But I, I was, want I was to... an, you know, I was an employee, just this one point, I was yes. an employee. Yeah. I was an employer some years ago when I was a lecturer at university. And the nature of the business was such that we had problems paying contributions on a, on a timely basis. And God rest his soul, one of my colleagues, who was chairman of the board, garnished my university salary to pay the contributions of my little company. 
I mean, you know, he didn't even call me and say, Maxine, I'm talking about, well, I'm not saying anything evil. So Frank Ali was the chairman at the time. And I was more surprised when I got my pay slip to see that they had garnished my salary, you know, and it it, it, it was, a, as far as I remember, the, the nature of the business was such that that was strange, but I let it be, um, you know, but so I'm saying that enforcement is important. It's important. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, thank you, uh, Ms. McLean. Um, Lynette, you were... Uh, yeah, uh, I, I, yeah, I wanted to ask um, Mr. Strickland if it is... Um, because in the note that I said, said around, one of the points I made was that when I first came into practice, somebody came to me from the national insurance. I didn't call them, but I believe that they would see the attorneys, because usually the attorneys are in the newspaper, and you know you have your names so somebody somebody came to me to talk to me about the national insurance and encouraged me to join the scheme so there they weren't even forced in, i didn't feel as though i was forced into doing it but you know if when you when you're in business and you start business you are trying to get the business going you're not really thinking about national insurance but um you know there's a way to know who, who has set up a business most people register as a business so all the business names are there at corporate affairs those who have incorporated those are there as well so maybe if we could um you know just meet people where they are and that should be one of the the functions within the nis as well that not only wait till people come in but also go out to people i think that that would be that would be very useful Marcia, there's something I want to, to add or to support Winston on because I my thing dropped out when he was speaking, but he was speaking to the sanitation workers. Right now, I have several sanitation workers in my union, and they complain about bending down and picking up cans and dropping them back on the truck. And it's on right now. They are 60, 65 going, and they are tired. They can't get it do. It's painful. Arthritis and all kinds of checking in already. But it is, it, is, it is even bit more than sanitation worker. Could you imagine a police constable downtown see a fellow run into a store and snatch a half of the things they run and he can say, <laughs> um, hold it, I'm the police. You're under arrest. He, he can't. And the fellow run levy. You know I, mean? <laughs> I, I, I am very serious. No, it's true. I, I might be, I might, I might be a little joke at it, but it's you don't want it 67 year old policemen, you don't want 60 year old policemen, you want policemen that are just as fleet as foot as the, as the fellows that they're chasing. You go home and beg you to stop. So this is the police, they command you to stop. That's all you can do. What about the firemen? You gotta go up and house to save my life. I, I, you want a house? I'm coming up on a ladder with a 65, 68 year old man, and I got somebody on my shoulder coming down. Arthritis hit me in the middle of the ladder. <laughs> oh, so we coming out fast now, you know. So these people are taking these steps without thinking. It's serious. It is serious. You know, they, they don't, they don't, they don't, they don't understand what they're doing. You know, okay. An accountant can work to ninety. Every brand keeps intact, but not a fireman, mm. not a policeman, yeah. not a sanitation worker. And you have a one size fit all for everything. I happen to know that in Saint Lucia. Policeman, I think it is after 20 years, son, after 25 years, you can retire a full pension. Because at that time, you can't run with the young boys. Prison officers, they're, they're in prison and they've got these young boys coming there. If I push it down, as has happened, and it's currently before the court, you know, but what, what, are we, what are we doing? We are not thinking. We are jumping to the width of... The MF. MF said this is how you go right? Then you were argue with them and said, no, we can't do that because and and, and the system over the years borrow started to create a middle class. And other administrations have continued to help develop this middle class. Because one thing you had rich and filthy poor. Mm. You don't have you don't have to do borrow created a middle class. If 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 you can um attribute anything to borrow at all. One thing you must attribute to him is the, that middle class that he that he developed by Trust me. And now 
this government is taking us back to the rich and the filthy poor because they eliminated the middle class and 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 when you have a situation now what they have done to people they are asking civil servants to pay toward a pension that they will not get because stephen here i'm glad he said us i'm so glad to see you um when you reach retirement age in the public service you can retire on your pension now if they and then you will get a pension from the treasury but when you reach age 67 that pension is reduced by the money you get for national insurance but when you bring all two ages to 68 you are now eliminating your little, little pension immediately as it becomes due so you don't get a single penny of your pension you will get the maturity, but you will not get any pension.